So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking to you from Paris in this Harassis uh, global meeting, and I have two excellent guests with me, Marcello Mena, who is the CEO of the Global Methane Hub and had a starred career previously as a politician, a minister in the government of Chile. And then I have uh, Sushil Chaudhry, whom some of you may have met just now in another panel. Um, Sushil is the CEO of TravelXAI.ai um, and is an entrepreneur with uh, three startups under his belt, as far as I can. I'm, I'm going, we're going to be talking about developing consistent measurements of pollution. Now, we all know if you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. Pollution is a big label. It covers a lot of things. Some of us think ocean plastic. Some of us think uh, pollution in the air. The historic vision of dust of chimneys spewing out smoke is only one part of a much larger puzzle. Um, and my two panelists today, both of them are approaching ways to tackle core aspects of pollution. Um, now, I'd like to ask Marcello perhaps to start by telling us a little bit about yourself, um, how you came into this uh, space, and what, have, what is it you're doing at the Global Methane Hub to try and work on issues of pollution. Marcello, please. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm really happy to join the Methane Hub because it's a continuation of my PhD career. Uh, when I was getting my PhD at the University of Iowa, we worked at tracking pollution across the world with NASA campaigns, which were filled with instruments that were able to measure and probe atmosphere in the way that we hadn't been able to do so before. We use atmospheric models to do so. And that helped set up the, the train of satellites that started in the decades of the 2000s, Terra, Aqua, and we started to track aerosol and other aspects of pollution. But since then, now, I, I, I became later uh, um, the Minister of the Environment for Chile, and I had to uh, use that information to develop forecasting systems that were used for air quality management. At this stage now, we need to face climate change. And we have a pollutant that has both a local effect and a global effect, which is methane. Methane comes from multiple sources, but the thing is it has a short-term warming potential and has contributed to recent short uh, warming that we've experienced. So therefore, since it is a more powerful uh, greenhouse gas per unit of, of, uh, of mass, then it is easier to track. And therefore, as we... Uh, take measures to reduce methane, we will be able to look at that progress, track that progress, probe how companies are doing themselves, uh, and looking at the change that we want to provide. So that's what we're doing at the Methane Hub, and it's a, a really fun because it allows me to go back and look at the science I used to do and, and make it useful, uh, even more useful than before. Thanks very much, Marcello. And of course, it's interesting when you say, look, look at the science. Um, in, in a lot of the um, concerns that people have had about climate, uh, so far an awful lot has been done through nature-based solutions. A lot has been done with the offset processes of uh, reforestation, planting trees, etc., for carbon capture in that form. You're really looking at the technical carbon capture, engineered uh, methane capture, um, and that's fascinating. So we'll come back to that because the, the, the economics of those engineered solutions are intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. Sushil, over to you, if I may. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you into the journey of using distributed ledger technologies in order to measure pollution. Okay. So firstly, uh, I'm honored to be on the panel uh, on Horasis as well as on the panel here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my background is I've, I've grew up in India, but have been in the U.S. since 2002, studied at USC, worked at Microsoft, uh, started a company in music streaming, got acquired. Uh, I'm on to my third startup now. My second startup was in retail. Uh, uh, in this, we are building, I'm an investor board member here, where we are helping uh, different industries uh, like mining, uh, textile, and pharma to for them to make substantial claims around carbon and then substantiate that uh, in a very transparent way. Right. So what we are doing is uh, <clears throat> we are helping, for example, a, a textile factory put its entire production, <clears throat> its processes, its carbon emission, its water payment, fair pay data around uh, male, female. All of that uh, is captured from the ERP and put onto blockchain and, and it's transparently shared to investors and to their customers, which are the U.S. and Western buyers. 
uh, to give that uh, ESG footprint. And carbon is, a, as you know, is a big, the biggest piece in the ESG is right now carbon, uh, which brings in not just uh, credibility to their claim, as we all know, we are aware of greenwashing and, and all kind of hand wavy claims that are being made. But the companies which are ahead of uh, ahead in their curve of you know of ESG adoption and and carbon, they are going to that next extra level of standing out from the crowd and saying, "I'm willing to put this data on blockchain on a distributed ledger, authenticated by the auditors like KPMG, and I'm willing to share this data in a very transparent way." Right? So that's why we are helping as a company. Infinity Chains is helping uh, these uh, manufacturing companies, this textile, this brands like. Uh, Abercrombie, uh, Patagonia, uh, and uh, the brands we see in Costco, Walmart, the white label brands, they, they are making those claims now. Right? So, uh, yeah, that's my quick one minute intro around my exposure to, to pollution and carbon. Thank you very much indeed, Sushil. Uh, and so you're working with those brands, you're creating a transparent, essentially a transparent audit platform, which allows for their footprints or the footprints of their value chains, their manufacturing and supply chains, to be to be audited by anyone. Can, can, I, audit. can I go and have a look and say, gosh, these are Abercrombie's numbers? Right. So audit is a strong word. I think first we should, uh, the way where industry is, first is we have to map the supply chain. Right. So today, as you all know, the, the goals that companies have taken is, is to map their supply chain. Right. So like... Um, uh, Carrefour has said that in next five years, they will map their supply chain. They will know where it's coming from. And they will then in the next few years after that, or where they will reduce their carbon footprint by, by 10, 20%. And then they'll be carbon neutral in the next eight years or 10 years. So our first, what we are, so first is mapping the supply chain. Second is making, being transparent about it. Right. And the third then is say, whatever claims I'm making, I'll also provide uh, an, an uh, audited version of it. Right. I think we are we are certainly away from that. Uh, the way economics is is around this industry, but certainly it is making it more publicly available. Uh, and uh, when you are making as a public as a public brand like Abercrombie or Patagonia, when you put something in the public domain, then you are inviting uh, any scrutiny on that. Right. Uh, I think that's where the industry is. The technology we provide is helping brands who are ahead in in this journey. They can they can make those claims. Uh, so you rightly said, you know. If you want to see what is the carbon footprint, right? What is the emission level, water usage of a particular Abercrombie jeans? You can do that with the select line of products that they have adopted this technology for. So they're piloting with a select line of products. Interesting. And, and we, in due course, we will be able to inspect and to audit, but not quite there yet, still mapping the supply chains. Right. Um, okay. Moving from carbon to methane, um, carbon dioxide, methane, sorry, they're both obviously carbons, but carbon dioxide to methane. Um, Marcello, uh, you know, Sushil's talked about retail chains, etc. Methane to the global public to a great extent is what cows produce. Um, but actually, of course, energy companies are very big players in that. Um, Sushil was talking about consumer brands. Can you tell us a bit about the ecosystem of the that the methane hub is working with and concentrating on in order to try and measure and reduce methane pollution mm -hmm. before that before the methane hub was uh, was started there's many initiatives to measure methane from uh, satellite observations and aircraft measurements so, so ghg sat from canada iros which is aircraft measurements in the us carbon mapper which will soon uh, go from uh, aircraft measurements to satellite measurements and methane sat, uh, which is EDF's uh, role. And they all look at the same thing in different angles, different resolutions. But what they want to do is that to keep track and make visible some of the things that we had ignored. So the IEA tracked all the satellite observations from the energy sector and estimated that methane leaks are, are actually 70% higher than declared by companies. And that is a big deal. 
because it goes from uh, the EPA estimated 1% leaking in the natural gas operations to the observed 10% leaking in the Permian Basin, where a lot of the natural gas comes from in the U.S. And that difference is really outst uh, outstanding because if you leak at higher than 5%, that means that your full life cycle greenhouse gas emissions may be higher than coal. So therefore, you know, we, we, we really need to start to uh, question whether this, uh, this, this uh, natural gas is a transition fuel or should we start calling it fossil gas, which is what it is. And, uh, you know, and the transition, you know, the bridge uh, that, that we it's already been passed. We have to go faster. We have to phase out fossil fuels. And this information allows us to move faster. But on the negative, on a, on a positive side, we can we will consume net fossil fuels for the time being for a while. And therefore we could use this information for improving the operations. And therefore the same way that Sushil uh, provides information uh, that will be trackable and not greenwashable, there are many platforms that actually contain all the observations from oil and gas and benchmark operations of a particular company. And therefore financial um, and uh, the financial sector could ask for disclosure on this information that's observed. Uh, it's not only self-declared, it's provided by an uh, independent in, uh, entity that will really provide the basis of where this company performs with respect to its peers. Very interesting. And, and But one of the things that worries me is that statistic you quoted at the beginning, the 1% to the 10% and the 5%. I mean, Quite apart from the <clears throat> polluting aspect of it, it's just terribly wasteful. I mean, why do the energy companies not actually utilize that gas? Why do they allow it to leak as opposed to capturing it? And we're in a world at the moment where gas happens to be at a bit of a premium. Why, why, why do they allow it to leak? Why aren't the energy companies seeing that there is a natural economic rationale for doing something as opposed to perhaps feeling that there is an external exogenous whether it's shareholder or public pressure well it's a, it's really interesting point because when we are we're looking at some climate finance numbers on methane side they haven't been published yet but we see that while we expected oil and gas mitigation to be substantive because they're essentially the the objectives are aligned as you say High energy prices uh, would want us to make a more of a profit and not waste this that we could be selling. Yet it seems that the short term uh, analysis under which some of these companies go uh, actually uh, keep, keep them from that investment. Maybe they know that uh, some of these fossil fuels are have will be short lived. So if they have a payback of investment, maybe in 10 years, and they know maybe that asset's not going to be worth much, maybe it's not worth investing. So uh, we have to look at uh, what uh, what the policy environment is for that. So it's not only a, a, a matter of being economic. We also need to uh, to keep the guardrails with regulation. And that's why it's so important that the EPA follows through with the announced regulations on methane leaking and the, that this is correctly enforced. And that's why this constellation of satellites that will be out in the world will be uh, crucial to keep track of progress, but also enforce. And this has already been used uh, more informally. They've been uh, leaks uh, detected on my satellites in state oil companies in Central Asia. And just the fact that you talk to some of the companies and tell them you're leaking and maybe they didn't know about it, then they could also improve. So it's not always the fact that uh, it, they, 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 they tend to ignore the problem, but there's a lot of ignorance in this, in this uh, topic too. Okay, so you're helping, your, your disclosure is a two-way disclosure. Your disclosure is, is a disclosure actually to the energy companies to help them as well as making a much larger public disclosure of what's actually happening. Yeah, since we fund multiple aspects of this, we fund the measurements, but we also fund the advocacy. So we also fund the local community that might be exposed to the plume of a, of a leaking operation that also co-emits carcinogenic compounds. So we also work with the environmental justice community. We believe that whatever is required for the change to occur is necessary. We can play the good cop and the bad cop. 
And that's what's fun about the job that we we could do. Uh, and we are also doing this with the waste sector. And, you know, in India, uh, recently in Delhi, there was a big fire uh, and in which there's a lot of uh, emissions occurring from the leaky methane from a landfill that had been abandoned. And now uh-huh. this also allows us to keep track of that, look at where the problem is, make an intervention. And the interventions that have already occurred in places like California have also driven not only a safer landfill and better neighbors, but also lower odor control complaints. So there's multiple aspects under which we could operate. uh, And ultimately, we want to work in the agricultural sector, which will be our biggest challenge. The satellite technology is not accompanying us yet. Uh, We've only been able to track very concentrated operations in the agricultural sector, but we will find the solutions down the line. We'll we'll come back to that, Marcello. We'll come back to that and explore how you work with the agricultural sector. Sushil, I saw you nodding um, and obviously recognizing the Indian uh, uh, landfill experience there that was being referred to. Um, Marcello also was touching on the question of advocacy. Can you talk a little bit about, because we hear quite a lot about advocacy and fashion industry, sustainable fashion, here in Paris, Change Now is about to start, uh, and the Change Now conference, I remember attending a couple of years ago, sustainable fashion was a very large part of the Change Now proposition. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about, not so much the technology underpinning, but more about the ecosystem and particularly about the, the advocacy and the pressures and how companies themselves are reacting and getting better? So so that's a great question. I think to bring about any change, right, what are the factors that can drive the change, right? So so one thing that we are seeing is, especially in the textile industry, it's this millennials, right? So there are probably there are two or three factors which are driving the change in a very big way. One is the millennials. Millennials, uh, we all know millennials have less money, but they care more, right? Uh, So they care uh, and, and... then they care and that gets impacted in the way they travel, in the way they consume fashion, in the way they're buying houses uh, and the way they are choosing where to work. It's, it's impacting everywhere. right? Uh, and, and fashion is probably one of the biggest win because, uh, because I think in terms of verticals, uh, oil and gas is the biggest contributor right, to, to this. But I think fashion is not far behind, probably is the third or fourth largest polluter in the world. Right. Uh, one is the, the production process, but the sheer amount of wastage that happens in fashion is a big contributor right? uh, and circularity and all is coming behind. But I think millennials are really looking for brands uh, which are, are sustainable, which are getting on the path of sustainability, which are making these claims and, and, and are building their storytelling and the customer connect along those lines. Right. And uh, it's not just me. It's uh, numerous surveys that have happened. And if you see H&M has come out with a line saying this is a sustainable, complete, their, their entire uh, fashion line is around sustainability, right? Macy's, uh, big retailers in US, Macy's, Target, Walmart, they've all taken big sustainability goals that they'll map their supply chain and they'll be carbon neutral or have 30% carbon uh, footprint, uh, right? Less carbon footprint in the next five years, 10 years. All of this is along the lines of that they, they're, they're shoppers. They want to make sure that they have the right, the right brand uh, identity in front of their millennial customers. So it's short term as well as long term because these guys are going to be their, their customers for the next 20, 30 years. So that's number one. And the second way, because these millennials uh, are looking at this, but probably the biggest, second biggest push that is driving the change in the industry is from the investors whether it is investors in the hedge funds, whether it's investors in, in, in the, the LPs in the big funds, the private equity funds, right? Which the funds which are basically uh, holding uh, substantial stakes in, in these public companies like, like the brands themselves or the retailers which are, which are doing this. They are pushing them that 30% by the next five years, 30% of your portfolio should be in sustainable companies which should, which should have a sustainable score of 60% or more. So it's, it's that direct. So the boards of any public company, whether it's a mining company, whether it's a fashion company, whether it's a pharmaceutical company, whether it's a logistics company, they're all pushed. And, and you guys know this more than me. They're all pushed to say, what is my sustainability agenda? What is my carbon footprint now? 
how am i going to improve it even if i don't want to adhere to any number but but the sdg united nation sdg sdg goals or gri goals are all about doing self benchmarking today and saying how am i going to improve in the next 5 years right so really you've got you 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 could argue that it's purely economic considerations it's it's the pocketbook of the consumer and it's the cost of capital essentially the financial institutions and their allocation of capital which is also driving the behaviors yeah. it's not necessarily because the companies themselves believe it but there's yeah. also a, a very severe economic leverage which is on them uh, for right. them even the and cost of borrowing is- even the cost right. of borrowing so one aspect is the capital available and the second is if you can prove that your company is sustainable in mining or in fashion you can borrow capital at probably 35 to 50 basis points cheaper than what is available for a traditional company right because, because you're recognized to be less of a risk less of an investment risk yes company. and you are sustainable right so both sides uh, yeah. so according to me those are the two big factors which are probably driving this change uh, in my mm-hmm. opinion yeah so shall you talked about mapping um mapping is a big word uh seven centuries of cartographers mapped the world google <laughs> has mapped the world in about seven years as far as i'm aware <laughs> how do you map a supply chain and particularly how do you get the right information into your blockchain into the the the, the, the integrity of the blockchain depends on what goes into it garbage yeah. in garbage out how sophisticated is that entry point these days so if you see there is so much greenwashing happening today right uh, i think as an industry and and what the lps of these funds are saying is first you map this right and and yesterday i was on a on a call where a manufacturer the the top global exports manufacturer garment manufacturer out of asia basically said i have 3000 suppliers what do you want me to do is your tool going to help me Uh, map all the 3000 suppliers what kind of onboarding time does it take can you onboard 100 suppliers in a month which will be about 25 a week which would mean five a day which would mean if each supplier has couple of factories how do you onboard them how will you scale how will the technology scale right so you're absolutely right how will this get mapped and then again garbage in garbage out how do you verif- verify the data that comes in and the answer there is i think the way we have to think cannot think of this as zero and one we have to think of becoming sustainable as, as we are at zero right now we don't even know what is happening i if i am walmart i probably don't even know where my suppliers are coming from right the first step in that direction is forget i'm not going to enforce anything but i just want to know where it's coming from that is mapping right i just want to know where my supplier how many how many of them are coming from bangladesh how many of them are coming from pakistan how many of them are from current india vietnam southeast asia uh right conflict areas africa wherever first i want to map that supply chain right then i'm going to look at my supply chain and say okay my top five guys in terms of volume or revenue or cost can i get them give them a two year road map to come board right and do a self certification where i'm going to ask them just upload your carbon data just upload your water data just upload your uh, your you know male to female ratio child whatever right your your certification of the factory i'm not going to verify it. no uh, i'm not going to be holding you but i want you to upload the data it's self certification right if there are public companies so if let's say walmart is buying something from india from wellspun which is the largest towel manufacturer in the world uh then it's if it's a public company even if they self certify that data it means something but if it's a small manufacturer it doesn't mean much but you have you've gone out the second level of that is can i get a auditor but i will get that auditor at my cost or whatever i choose the auditor and they'll certify this now there can be you know corruption what not and then the third level is as walmart i will appoint the auditor and they will do the certification i think so we we cannot think of 0 to 1 right we we have to think of this as as really first stage is mapping the supply chain and i would say even to map the supply chain for some of the complex ones where carbon is a big pollution and carbon is a big driver it is going to take years right will li- will really have to go you know uh, the public companies and say okay can you be more accountable and you 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 drive it through the public companies but ultimately those public companies are dealing with what you've described as like, down at the ground level it's mom and pop shops yeah, um, yeah. as much yeah. as anything 
yeah, uh, yeah. that are part of the, their supply chains. Yeah. Marcello, I suspect, um, and maybe you're on mute, but I suspect, Marcello, that may be similar to the challenges that you're facing in agriculture, where some agriculture is big, but an awful lot of agriculture is very small. So tell us a little bit about, do you have the same challenges there in the, when you address the agricultural sector, and how do you look at methane in agriculture? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So we have the agriculture sector accounting for around 40% of emissions and the waste sector, organic waste, which is an extension of the food system, is also around 20%. So most of the methane emissions actually come from the food system at large and agriculture is very much in that realm. And when we look, and this is some of the NGOs have uh, submitted reports, for example, blind spot report, report by Changing Markets, which uh, highlight that many of the dairy companies, for example, they do net zero commitments and they are, you know, they, they, they probably uh, feel very proud when they report to their investors, but they are actually putting the milk in scope three emissions and therefore not accounting. It's not part of their commitment. And so 90% of the emissions are actually off the books. And therefore, you know, we need to work with them to get good numbers and to, um, to you know, work with, the, with their providers and have better emissions factors, characterize the sectors. In India, for example, the dairy sector is much different than it would be in Africa or in California. You know, whether it's concentrated, expansive, the types of cows, what they're being fed, where they're roaming, whether they're confined, the open range, all these things determine uh, the emissions. And if we have generic emission factors, we will, the only way to reduce that is having less cows. But that's not the point. The point is whether we could give them, you know, a better productivity because the ways that we feed them or the ways that we breed them or the ways that we give them a, a, an inhibitor that actually inhibits the formation of methane in the rumen. And there's a lot of breakthroughs that are really exciting, you know, UC Davis and others. And Ben and Jerry's recently announced that they're gonna have low methane milk in their ice cream because it, you're feeding this algae to the cows. And right. so there's mul multiple things that can be done, but we need to raise the capacity. And a lot of the work that we're doing is actually supporting countries, their ministers of agriculture to have better uh, estimations of what the emissions are, what the levers are possible to reduce those emissions. Because the real reason why we're doing this is because we're not going to reach net zero. We're not going to reach 1.5 degree warming unless we work on methane. The recent IPCC report says that we have to reduce emissions of methane around 45% by 2040. And we could do a lot of that with the energy sector. We're not doing enough, but we will not do it if we do not reduce emissions in the agricultural sector. Well, people talk about, uh, indeed, going to plant-based diets as being one of the best ways of reaching that, uh, uh, that our, our 1.5 target. Um, but culturally across, well, both culturally and economically across the world, uh, plant-based diets, some parts of the world just say, we like meat. And other parts protect cows, as indeed in India, so you should, you've got that protection system. Yeah. Gentlemen, I'm conscious we've got just a few minutes left. What I'd like to do is give you a chance to just come forward with your two, three clear prescriptions and statements of what you see needs to be done in order to really enhance this consistent measurement of pollution and make it impactful by being measurement which then can be transformed into execution and action. Sushil, mm -hmm. I give you... Three good concrete steps, please. I think the first one we think is, uh, uh, I, th I can think of, is, is uh, giving some incentive for the companies to first do any kind of disclosures with it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not to question on them, but uh, give some incentive for the companies to just start disclosing what is happening at their end, right? For, for pollution, emission, and uh, just give them some financial incentive or, or give them some marks on SDG scores, which probably happens. But uh, g create financial incentives, uh, capital models, you know, funding models or, you know, uh, grants around self-disclosures. Right? I think uh, when the company is doing that and if few companies start doing it, a lot more companies will start doing it. And then at least there will be an, a larger 
uh, pool of data that we can say what is the trend what is happening but as you rightly said uh, what cannot be measured cannot be tracked and can be reduced right so first thing is is of course with, with the with methane hub that marcelo is doing where they are capturing what is happening but that is um, i think uh, other way is for these these actors to sort of report it themselves right so i think that's the first thing to create incentive structures around some kind of self reporting of this data and and guys who are doing it just for reporting and not not reducing just by reporting creator create some incentives for them right that's the first thing the companies which are thought leaders in this should substantiate those claims because if you are ahead of the curve for example right can they substantiate their claim and and establish themselves as as role models in the industry by by being transparent about that data and uh, create a road map for other smaller companies or their their competitors which are behind uh, uh create a role model there right it it will help them establish themselves as as thought leaders give them a pole positions in terms of sustainability their brand presence if they're already doing the work then and go that extra step to make it transparently available and and publish that data right that will that will uh, set a benchmark for for smaller companies other companies to follow compete on uh, as they go forward right uh, i think that's the second thing i can think of uh, i think yeah that's that's pretty much it, i think those two is uh, would be my recommendation interesting sushil thanks very much i mean um both of those are really related to reward or related to very positive um approaches there's also historically there's been a bit of a tendency to name and shame as well for the ones who aren't doing it there's been much more focused on that than there has perhaps on the incentive so it's interesting you're focusing very much on that incentive approach and i love the idea of the thought leaders the role models um essentially putting together not in any form of sort of um antitrust issues but actually collaborating in order to drive forward policy we've seen it i was at a meeting yesterday in zurich we've seen very similar things happening in the carbon certification mm-hmm. where there's now a bit of a fragmentation in terms of different forms of different styles of carbon certification different organizations and I think everyone recognizes it's time actually to bring things together as opposed mm-hmm. to being fragmented. Yeah. Marcello, let me go over to you now. What are your recommendations, your two three key pieces that need to be achieved? Yeah, we we had to deploy that uh, constellation of satellites to get them ready to measure uh, and track progress and that's why it's re- really great news that right now uh the con- the the um, state of California has in their budget a uh, hundred million dollars to actually set up a methane accountability to help work and measure this globally. This will allow to make that problem visible and useful. That could go and trickle into the financial disclosures, ask companies to disclose CO2 emissions. Then we have to look at the regulation. For example, is the SEC going to require scope three emissions, the ones that come from their providers, is that going to allow uh, the big uh, dairy companies to include that in their numbers and stop ignoring them? And that will enable environment under which the financial flows will benefit those who actually acknowledge and manage their emissions, those that don't mm-hmm. ignore them. And look at the rest of the policy environment. What's keeping this change from occurring? Is it because uh, the way that they're evaluating projects is too short term? Is it, you know, are we falling again, as Mark Carney said, into the tragedy of horizon? And if we are, then we have to have the regulations that force the action that we know needs to be done, but sometimes is with it without the, is not prioritized because other short-term gains uh, are above the measures that we know we need to do to have better operations. So I think that's what we'd be doing this decade. We have to have a sprint of methane mitigation this decade. And if we do so, we'll be able to keep warming down around 0.4 degrees, according to the IPCC, and that will ensure us to be under the 1.5 degree target and keep 1.5 alive. Excellent. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, but Marcello, picking up on some of that, though, you're, you're, you're really, you know, Sushil was very much um, private sector incentivization, et cetera. There was a little bit to talk about subsidy, but my sense there is that subsidy may have been economic or um investment uh encouragement etc 
Whereas um, Marcello, I think you've got more of a you're, you're you're sensing or you're describing much more of a regulatory pressure as well as being yes. necessary. Um, and which of the bodies are there bodies that at the moment are not effective? Obviously, the methane hub is extremely effective, um, but are there bodies which are not effective, which could actually, frankly, be encouraged to get their act together and make more impact? I mean, I guess it's it's the way the approach that we want to have for this. You know, the, the, our team is full of uh, policymakers that have, actually have worked in things that have caused change, and others uh, there are activists that have actually led campaigns to phase out fossil fuels and coal. So it's a great mix of different uh, different uh, uh, focus uh, focus on this. But the real the real uh, expertise, I believe, is understanding that a problem is not going to be solved just throwing money at it. It's actually looking at what the incentives are, what the markets are. And sometimes you have to have regulations to make this work. And comparing global uh, efforts, California's approach, EU's approach, Africa, India, South America, we could find the truth of what's most effective. And many times it's actually preventing us from doing stupid stuff. It took us many, many years to acknowledge that we probably shouldn't put organic waste in, in, the, in the trash. We should probably make compost out of it. Today, we have another incentive, high commodity prices for ammonia and fertilizer. And so now we could finally close the loop, have a true circular economy we've been uh, talking about, and we could get out of the fossil fuel circle that, you know, fertilizers have. So the thing is, this really allows us to look into the sectors that have been neglected for many years. We have wins in the energy sector. We need to use that same approach. In my case, I worked in Chile, and it was very successful. We're actually announcing uh, a point to 100% renewable energy by 2030, which is substantive, Excellent. right? Very good. Uh, and, and it is because we broke, we cracked the system on the energy sector. Now we need to crack the system on waste, not as sexy, and uh, food, you know, very personal, very intimate, very, very uh, politically charged. But we have to do it. Otherwise, we're not going to get to 1.5 degrees. Marcello, thanks very much indeed. Sushil, I come back to you. Um, Marcello has described the act as what needs to be done to crack it. We, you gave us some very clear um, indications of what your thoughts were on incentives and on the role models. Um, you're talking a very large sector as well. There are a lot of organizations out there in it. Um, how many, can you help them all alone? How many of you are needed in order to make that happen? And who else is needed? What is the final rallying cry to other people to come together in your sector? Uh, so the great thing that is happening is, I think I'll say that in, in India alone, in the last three years, there were 130 plus funds created with multi-billion dollars in under uh, under management in each of them, which were which will invest only and only in ESG-centered companies, sustainable companies, right? Uh, so when I say the alignment of financial incentives need to happen, right? I think that is the kind of change we are seeing, right? Uh, so that's if those funds are there, imagine the number of companies that need to do that they need to invest in, which basically it's going to be new companies and it's probably going to be existing companies becoming more uh, uh, more sustainable, more uh, pollution-friendly, carbon-friendly. Right? Uh, so that's one. Now, uh, where Infini Chains is, where basically we are helping them substantiate those claims, right? be more transparent about it, uh, capture the data, which, which is good for internal housekeeping and then external uh, marketing and publishing, right? Uh, I think uh, every sector, and I think there is going to be, there is so much opportunity that it's pretty much going to be taken sector by sector, right? I think we already have, uh, we have competitors in the textile space. Uh, we are in textile and pharma. Uh, so we think that we are in the top two or three, but every sector we can think that there's going to be at least three, four, five companies which are going to be uh, helping, you know, and, and substantiating this. We also know that the big force of consulting and audits are already looking at this in a very big way. They're looking at deploying tens of thousands of their team members in the ESG space, each one of them, right? Uh, for ESG, especially oh, in a, Europe. So you've got a pretty powerful, um, a powerful industry, literally, around 
these industries and the measurement of pollution. Thanks. Gentlemen, we've come to time, and I really just wanted to thank you very much for a great conversation. Um, we have Marcello Mena and Sushil Chaudhry. Thank you very much indeed for your perspectives on developing consistent measures of pollution. And uh, let us all wish you every success in driving forward the changes that your organizations are promoting. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to our audience and uh, look forward to seeing you at another Harassis event in the future. Goodbye. Thank you. Yes, you did a phenomenal job in driving the discussions. And uh, so thank you so much for having us. Yeah, very fun. Thanks so great much. Great meeting you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.